blessing we are we have at our church with all the piano players take your bibles turn with me to the book of judges judges chapter 13 judges yeah the book of judges oh yeah uh, judges chapter number 13 and uh, have you ever like put the, together a puzzle and you're sort of getting toward the end of the puzzle and there is a piece it's it's there but it's not there and you're looking for that piece, and you begin to doubt, you begin to wonder, is there actually a piece, like is it, what, what is the piece of the puzzle, where is it at, and you're searching diligently, and sometimes you'll look off the table, and there it is on the floor, and you'll pick it up, and when you find that piece of the puzzle, and the whole puzzle, the picture comes together, the picture of that puzzle comes together, you know what I'm talking about, you're like, woo, praise the Lord, this is wonderful, have you ever had a puzzle where the piece is missing still, have you ever it's just always sort of a, an eyesore, sort of, ugh. But tonight, we're going to look at the, the, a piece of the puzzle. We're going to look at the Nazarite vow or a Nazarite vow. Have you ever thought about a Nazarite vow? Where, where is a Nazarite vow found in the Bible? Who in the Bible took a Nazarite vow? And uh, was Jesus, was Jesus one that took the Nazarite vow? And uh, we're going to look into that. And it's going to start right here in Judges chapter number 13 with the birth of Samson. And if you can, stand with me for the reading of God's word. I'll start reading in verse number one, if you'll follow along with me there in Judges chapter 13, starting in verse number one, the Bible says, and the children of Israel did what? Evil, Evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines, how many years? 40 years. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, beware, I pray thee, and I beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink and eat not any unclean thing for lo thou shalt conceive and bear a son and no razor shall come on his head now read this little phrase with me for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb say that phrase with me again for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And very, very interesting, it mentions Samson being a Nazarite. What does that mean to be a Nazarite? What is a Nazarite vow? Where in the Bible is that found, the Nazarite vow? It is a fascinating Bible study, and I'm very excited about this, and I believe by the end of this message, you're gonna say, wow, we found that piece of the puzzle, and it's gonna help you in your Bible study and your Bible reading for years and years to come. And uh, praise the Lord. Let's uh, do this. Let's bow our heads, bow our hearts, and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. And thank you, Lord, for a group of people that are interested in studying your word. Amen. And Lord, this is an interesting subject, the Nazarite vow. And I pray that you fill me full of your Holy Spirit and your power. And without a doubt, there's some use to this. There's some practical application without a doubt for us here this evening, Lord, and I pray that you help us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. Lead us and guide us and help us. In Jesus' name, amen. And uh, as you, you look at this scripture right here in Judges chapter number 13, you're going to have the birth of Samson. Samson, a great judge in the Bible. Uh, by the way, Samson found in Hebrews chapter number 11 as a man of faith. And uh, Samson from his birth was to partake of a Nazarite vow. I want you to look back with me at verse number five again. Look at this again. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a what? Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now watch verse six, what happens here. It's really, really interesting because in verse number six, then the woman came and told her husband saying, a man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, 
and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean. What does it say? For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Now, verse number eight is sort of where it's leading to. Imagine uh, Manoah hearing that from his wife. He's, what are, what, what are you talking about? A Nazarite from the time of his, his birth? He's gonna be a Nazarite? What do you mean? Look at verse number eight. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us, teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And so he wanted to be taught. If, if he's gonna be a Nazarite, what does that mean to be a Nazarite from your birth? Now they did have some instructions right there about the wine and the no razor to the head and not touching an unclean thing. But what does that mean right there? And where in the Bible does it talk about being a Nazarite or having a Nazarite vow? Well, it's very interesting if you take the, the, the Bible and turn it back over, or not back over, but turn it over to the book of Numbers chapter number six, and we're gonna find in Numbers chapter six, the first 21 verses give us a detailed account of what a Nazarite vow is. And it's exciting, it's glorious, it's wonderful, it's fantastic. We'll be back in Judges chapter 13 a little bit later, but you're turning over to Numbers chapter number six. Numbers chapter six. Now, you're there. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, what? Numbers, Numbers. okay. And, uh, then one, two, three, four, five, six. six. We got about half of you there. We'll get that eventually right there. You'll learn your numbers and you'll learn the book of the Bibles through time. Don't be discouraged, don't be discouraged. Uh, look at verse number one, Numbers chapter six, verse one. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, and you see that Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when either man or woman, man or who? Woman. woman, shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord. Now, now stop right there. There's a lot going on in the first verse right there, the first two verses. The Lord spake to Moses and he begins to declare, begins to explain what a vow of the Nazarite is. It can be, number one, a man or a woman. It can be not just a man, but it can be a man or a woman. And basically, the gist of it is shall separate themselves to vow a vow of the Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. And you, you, you see this, there's gonna be a man or a woman that really wants to, to get close to the Lord. They wanna take a, a special time period. And you'll notice that this is not normally a vow for life, but it's a set period of time where they all of a sudden take and want to get closer to the Lord. Have you ever had a time where you, you really need to, needed God in your life. And we know we need God in our life, but there's special times where you really need an answer from God. You really need direction. You really need to have some understanding. And all of a sudden you separate yourself. You, you dedicate some time. Maybe it's a time where you fast, where you, you give up food for a portion of time. You, rather than eating, you go and get alone with God and you cry out to God. You say, God, I need your direction. I need some answer. I need you to, to fill me, to guide and direct. And so what you're finding here is there was a time uh, of the Nazarite vow where people were going to be separating themselves to the Lord. They were going to vow the vow of a Nazarite, and it was really a time period that they vowed that to get close to the Lord, separate themselves from certain things to get close to the Lord. So we continue. Look at this in verse number three. Separate himself. Look at this. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine, or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor, liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. Why? Now, there's a big list right there, and it's sort of giving you, he's gonna say, hey, you need to separate yourself from wine and strong drink. You, you remember the children of Israel, they're, they're coming into the promised land. By the way, in the book of Numbers, they're wandering in the wilderness, but they get to uh, the, uh, the place where they're gonna go into the promised land. They sent the spies out to the promised land. What did they come back with? They came back with a cluster of grapes, the grapes of Eshkel. Do you remember that? And so the, the, the promised land was a place that was a, a land flowing with milk and honey. It had grapes in abundance right there. 
and wine was a common drink. Now, this is going to lead to a lot of questions, which I'm really excited about. You, you have strong drink, you have vinegar of wine, you have the vinegar of the strong drink, you have the liquor of grapes, you have moist grapes, dried grapes, all sorts of stuff right there. Next week, I'm going to be preaching a message about wine in the Bible. What is wine in the Bible? And wow, preparing for that, you're going to be very interested in being here next uh, Wednesday as we look at wine in the Bible. What does the Bible say about wine in the Bible? And I honestly think some of you are going to go, wow, I never thought about it like that way. And some of maybe even some of your preconceived ideas about wine might be shattered and it's going to be interesting interesting all the way around next week and guess where we're going to be at the book of Judges and the book of Numbers right here and then we're going to be all over the Bible wine in the Bible but they say hey you're going to separate from that common drink of wine and you're not going to be able to drink with that now look at this in verse number five the vow of the Nazarite all the days of the vow of his separation there shall no what is that razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in the which he separated himself unto the Lord he shall be holy and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow now this is interesting because it says separate yourselves from the razor upon his head so during this vow whether it's going to be 30 days or 60 days or 100 days. And, you know, the Bible, it, it, I couldn't find anywhere where it said a time frame about these vows or as many commentaries have said the vow is normally for 30 days or 60 days or up to 100 days. Uh, and then there was a few, they would say, that a lifetime vow like Samson. But as you look at that, there was no razor. What, but what about the hay? What, but what about the hair? I, I wish I had me some hair every once in a while. Amen. And why was it offered to God? In the, the book of Numbers, chapter number six, it doesn't just, and, and this is where we get funny sometimes. It doesn't really specifically mention not cutting your hair, but it, it mentions no razor to your head. And so we get to going in a little bit, and you're going to see a little bit later where at the end of the Nazarite vow, they're going to allow the razor to come to their hair, and they're actually going to offer their hair as a burnt sacrifice, which is really, really interesting. But, but think about that, the hair, and uh, the hair that we have on our head in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse 14, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. And, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But no matter what, there's some interesting questions there. At the very end of this Nazarite vow, we just think of the men, but it wasn't just men, it was women. And at the very end of this vow, whether you're a man or woman, you're gonna shave your head. And think about a woman losing all of her hair. In, in a way, it would be a, a difficult time for that woman right there. Then, does it, does it mention, uh, you, you think about it, if it's a period where they don't get a, uh, a razor to their head for 30 days or 60 days or a uh, hundred days, uh, the man's hair, how much hair do you grow in a hundred days? And then it goes to the uh, question we're going to look at a little bit later uh, with Samson. Did Samson actually have long hair? And I'm going to show you uh, a verse and think about that. It'll be very, very, very interesting right there. But we go a little bit further. Look at verse number six. And uh, separate yourself from strong drink. Separate yourself from the razor upon your head. And then verse 6, it says, All the days that he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no what? Dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die, because the consecration of God is upon his head. Now, that's very interesting. I don't to say that I understand all of it, but part of the vow was you're not going to go to any uh, a dead body. Don't touch a dear body. Don't come unto it. It doesn't matter what's your dad. It doesn't matter what's your mom. It doesn't matter if somebody close to you. Separate yourselves from uh, dead bodies. Then the summary, summary of the, this, remember you're going to separate yourself from wine, strong drink. You're going to separate yourself from uh, using a razor on your head. Then you're going to separate yourself from dead body. Then verse 8. Look at verse 8. All the days of, the, of his separation, all the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord. So it's a, it's a really consecration time. It's a separation time. It's a time to get really, really serious about the things of God. 
you're not going to partake in any of the juice or the uh, juice of the land that's very common, and uh, we'll look at a little bit of that next week, like I said. Boy, if, you're, if, if during this your dad dies, you can't go and grab him and pick him up and, and go and lay him in the burial or anything like that. You're going to separate that. During that time, you're not going to let a razor come to your head. Now, you're going to see a breaking of the, the separation. You're going to see, and this is very serious. It's sort of, it's interesting. Look, look at verse 9. You're going to see a break of it. You're going to see a mis- uh, when I say mistake, I'm, I'm, to say mistake, it's wrong. The Bible will call it, as you'll see, a sin. And it said, if any man die very suddenly by him, okay, and he hath defiled the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day shall he shave it. And on the eighth day he shall bring two turtles or two young pigeons to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering and make an atonement for him for that he sinned. Called it a sin. He made that vow and next thing you know, even though that person died suddenly and you know, we, could, we, we can make an excuse for it, but it's saying, hey, that's a sin. And when they sinned right there, here's what you're going to do. You're going to offer a sin offering. You're going to offer a burnt offering for that he sinned by the dead and shall hallow his head that same day. Now, that's very, very interesting right there. It's just saying if something happens during that time where you break that vow, even if it came suddenly right there, it's serious business because what this time period that you're setting apart as a Nazarite vow, it means something. It means something to you. You're doing it for a purpose. You're, you're getting yourself a setup where you're holy and separate and consecrated for the Lord. By the way, that, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Look, look at verse 12, the way it's worded. And he shall, and it uses the word consecrate. He shall consecrate unto the Lord the days of his separation. Uh, what he's doing is he say, consecrate. You're going to make these days of separation, you're going to make them sacred. You're going to make these day, days, days of separation where you're devoting your soul, your life, your everything to the service and worship of God. It's a big deal. It's an exciting big deal. There's a person who's making, not everybody made a Nazarite vow, but there were times when a man or a woman where they made a Nazarite vow to get close to the Lord. They separated for some things right there, and the purpose was to consecrate unto the Lord the days of his separation. Now, verse number 12 again, it says, and shall bring a lamb of the first year for a trespass offering. But the days that were before shall be lost because the separation was defiled. Now, we get to the fulfillment of this. And so uh, in verse 13 to 21, you're going to see the fulfillment of this, separa- uh, this separation of the Lord. It's going to give some closure how to end the Nazarite vow. Once again, I couldn't find a time frame in the Bible of how long it exactly was. A lot of the people I wrote, they, they would say 30 days, 60 days, 100 days. But I couldn't find a definite time period, but there's definitely in the, in the Nazarite vows an end to it. Look at verse number 13. And this is the law of the Nazarite, when the days of his separation are what? Okay, so there's a fulfillment of the, the Nazarite vow. There's a time when it ends. And so he says, he shall be brought into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So the, the, the person who did the Nazarite vow, man or woman, is going to come to the door of the tabernacle. You remember the tabernacle? Boy, it's a big deal, isn't it? He has the holy place, the holy of holies. It's where the priests offer sacrifices, all sorts of stuff right there. It's a big deal. Imagine the end right there. You're, you're in a, a place where uh, the holy of holies is, the Ark of the Covenant is. Wow. There, you're being brought to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Then verse 14. And he, he shall offer his offering unto the Lord, one he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering. So you're going to bring a lamb for a burnt offering. One ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering. So you're going to get to the door of the tabernacle. You're going to offer a lamb for a burnt offering. One ewe lamb for a sin offering. Then one ram without blemish for peace offerings. So there's a lot there. There's three different offerings right there. And then it continues. You're going to bring in verse 15 in a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil and their meat offering and their drink offerings. And then the priest gets involved. Verse 16, and the priest shall bring them before the Lord and shall offer his sin offering and his uh, burnt offering. And he shall offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord when the, with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall offer also his meat offering and his drink offering. Okay, 
boom. There's a lot, and we're reading a lot. Just understand, there's an end. You're done. Whether it's 30 days, 60 days, 100 days, whether it's a year, you're done. You come to the end of it, and you've consecrated those days to the Lord. You're holy. You're set apart. You've stayed away from wine, strong drink, vinegar of wine, vinegar of liquor. Uh, you've stayed away from all of that. You've stayed away from dead bodies. You haven't shaven your head at all. You get there. You're at the, the door of the tabernacle. You brought your ewe lamb, your sin offering, your other lamb, your ram. And you brought your, your basket full of the unleavened cakes right there. And you get there. The priest's involved. You, there's almost a celebration time. There's a, a dedication time, sort of a time that ends right there. It's a monumental time. It, it's an amazing time, the end of this Nazarite vow. And then we go to this. Oh, look at verse number 18. Look at this. And the Nazarite shall shave the head uh, shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shall take the hair of the head of his separation and put it in the fire, which is under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. Okay, stop. Stop, 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 stop. At that period of time, you brought all those, the, the, the different peace offering and so the different ram, the ewe lamb, the lamb, and then all of a sudden, it's time for you to shave, man or woman, you shave your hair and you're offering your hair as a sacrifice. It's going on there. It's a hair sacrifice, it looks like, right? I wouldn't have much, but praise the Lord, we're gonna give what we got, amen. And look at the next verse, the way it's worded, verse 19. And the priest shall take uh, the sodden shoulder of the ram and one unleavened cake out of the basket and one unleavened wafer and shall put them in upon the hands of the Nazarite after the hair of his separation is shaven. Okay. Then we're getting to the grand finale. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. This is holy for the priest with the wave breast and heave shoulder. And after that, the Nazarite may drink wine. It's over. It's over. You can drink wine now. Your, your Nazarite vow is over. Verse 21 is the last verse in this, describing this. This is the law of the Nazarite who hath vowed and of his offering unto the Lord for his separation. Beside that, 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 that his hand shall get according to the vow which he vowed, so he must do after the law of his separation. That's it. It's interesting. It's, and I don't think it's overcomplicated. I think it's very simple. A man or a woman at a time in their life, they, they've got decisions or something's going on in their life, they need to make sure that they're close to the Lord. So they decide to follow Numbers chapter number six to be close to the Lord. They make a, a Nazarite vow. They say for a certain period of time, whether it's 30 days, 60 days, 100 days, that what we're gonna do is I'm not gonna put a razor to my head. I'm not gonna come close to strong drink, wine, anything like that. I'm not gonna be close to a dead body. And I'm gonna consecrate those days. I'm gonna give those days and dedicate those days to the almighty God. I'm gonna be separate from things. And boy, you can imagine the Lord working in the life of that person. They're serious. Not everybody's serious. I do think you can't be having days like that all the time, though we ought to be consecrated to the Lord. But that's, it's a special day. It's very similar to when you fast. Uh, if you go, go and fast, there's, there's some times when we ought to prayer and fast. This fourth come, time cometh forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. In other words, God was saying, Jesus was saying to the disciples, there needs to be a time when you get alone. You consecrate, you separate yourself from, from things. At this time, food, and you go to the Lord and ask him for things. Boy, if I can just tell you, this has a lot of application for us today. Maybe we're not getting away and, and consecrating our, our, ourselves to the Lord uh, at times in our life. There needs to be some time. Sometimes we jump to a decision very quickly without maybe taking some time, extra time with the Lord. And there's some fulfillment of that in the New Testament that we can look at right there. And oh, there's so much more in here that's exciting right there. So go back to Judges chapter 13. Here, here becomes a question. So who in the Bible do we know that took a Nazarite vow? Okay. Samson. Anybody else? Paul. Okay. Anybody else? It's interesting. Now here's what we're going to do. Uh, I, I read by somebody that Samuel uh, took the Nazarite vow in Judges chapter 13 and eventually pushed the pillars down. 
and I'm not messing up, that's what they wrote, okay? They, they wrote Sam, it was, it was Samson, it wasn't me who wrote that. And so there, there's a lot of things you can read that are very funny, but we as Bible believers have the best place to go and that's called the Word of God. If you just read the internet and say even some commentaries, you'll find out that Samuel pushed these pillars down and killed 3,000 Philistines. And uh, you can find a lot of interesting things, but the Bible gives us the answer. Somebody say amen. amen. So what about Samson? Let's just look at verse number five. The verse number five. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a... Nazarite. Nazarite. Verse number seven it says the same thing, for the child shall be a now, to God from the womb to the day of his death. Now, this is an interesting one because Samson was going to have that Nazarite vow on him from the time he was born to the time he died. That's not the way it was put in Numbers chapter 6. So this is a special case. Without a doubt, uh, the angel of the Lord came. You're going to be a Nazarite from the time you're born till the time you die. How many agree with that? I mean, we can see that. We can go a little bit further uh, into Judges chapter 16. Turn a few pages over to Judges chapter uh, 16. And uh, we can imagine, and I've heard many people say, he didn't say you couldn't cut your hair. You just couldn't have a razor to your head. And I, I wouldn't argue with that. I can read that it says razor. But did Samson have long hair? Look at verse number 13. It says this in Judges 16, verse 13. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, now he's lying, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. That seems like he's got some long hair there. And uh, now I could be wrong right there, but that in my reading right there, to weave some hair, you got to have some hair to weave. And so... Right? Does that make sense to you? I, I just don't have it right here. But Samson obviously had it, okay? And uh, once again, if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. By the way, if people will uh, take one verse out of context, uh, how, how many people took the Nazarite vow from birth uh, all the way to death? I find Samson did. We're going to look at a few others and see if we find any others, okay? So go to a little bit further. Judges chapter 16, verse 17 that he told her all his heart and said unto her, there hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Okay, verse 22, Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. By the way, if you look at the pictures of Samson, sometimes you ever, ever see paintings of Samson in the pillars. Uh, I'd say that 99% of them, he's got long hair. And, uh, and I wonder, man, that his, his hair grew real fast then because they had to shave his head at that period of time to lose his strength. So uh, can I just say another thing that often artwork uh, depicts things often very wrong from the Bible. We're Bible believers, not necessarily artwork believers. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord. We go a little bit further. Go to uh, the book of Lamentations chapter 4. The Nazarites are mentioned in two other places in the Bible, two other places with the word na na Nazarites. And so Lamentations, as you're turning to Lamentations, remember Lamentations, the lamenting of the destruction of Jerusalem. And so the weeping prophet, and so it's, it's, it's describing the destruction of Jerusalem. In chapter four of Lamentations, verse uh, number nine, it says, says this, number, Lamentations 4, verse 7. Her Nazarites, that would be Jerusalem, were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. Okay, and that, that's about it. You could read that a little bit. They were, and it was describing Jerusalem, how uh, wonderful Jerusalem was at a time. And obviously at one period of time, at this period of time, they even had people that were taking the Nazarite vows. And he was saying that they're, they're pure, they're, they're wonderful, they're glorious right there. And so it doesn't mention who they were, it just mentions there were a group of people that had that Nazarite vow later on. Go over, if you will, to the book of Amos. <laughs> That's a good prophet right there. My last son is named Amos, Amos, Amos. Amos chapter 2. 
And uh, if you remember, this is that prophet uh, from Tekoa. He's actually a herdman from Tekoa. He goes up to the northern kingdom of Israel, and uh, he says, for three transgressions and for four. And he begins to preach to the, the people of Israel, uh, the southerner preaching to the children of Israel, the nation of Israel right there. And he says about the transgressions of Damascus, the transgression of the Amorites. Then he gets to, to hear in verse number six. Thus saith, Lamos chapter two, verse six. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. Now, you're, you're, you have to study these things. The Bible is amazing. But if you can understand Amos right there, he, he's saying, hey, for three trans, the straw that broke the camel's back, the nation of Israel, you've turned your backs on God. You're not pleasing to the Lord. You've forsaken the Lord. What you've done is wrong. Okay, so he's chastening. He's saying, thus say the Lord. The Lord is not happy with Israel. Okay, so that helps you understand a few verses later when you get to verse number 11. Amos chapter two, verse 11. And this is sort of the turn. And I raised up your, of, of your sons, verse 11. And I raised up your sons for prophets and of your young men for Nazarites. Nazarites. Is it not even thus, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord? But ye gave the Nazarites wine to drink. Is that good or bad? Bad. bad. And commanded the prophets, prophets saying, prophesy not. So the prophet there is speaking to the Nazarites. He's saying, God, God gave you Nazarites, people that were separated unto the Lord, but what you've done is you gave them wine to drink. You, you gave them something they, they weren't allowed to have. You, you were leading them to break the Nazarite vow. By the way, boy, God de despises and, and does not like it when we have a young man or a one woman who is making a, a consecrating themselves to the Lord. They're dedicating themselves to the Lord. They're living for the Lord, and we put a stumbling block in front of them? Boy, there's a lot to learn right there. Boy, we as a church ought to not put any stumbling block on anybody who's trying to live a, a life that is holy and acceptable unto God. Boy, we ought to be a place where we, we nurture that, we encourage that, we help that. And boy, praise God for the people of our church that are living lives that are holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. You go a little bit further, look at this. What about Samuel? Go over to 1 Samuel chapter number 1. We're going to look at Samuel, John the Baptist, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look at Paul, I think, for a moment. And Samuel, some of these are interesting. And, um, and if you read this, we're going to try to go through this quickly. Because what's, did Samuel take of the, the Nazarite vow? So remember Hannah in verse number 9. Hannah rose up after she had eaten in Shiloh. She, she wanted to have a baby. In verse number 11, she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept sore. Verse 11, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life and there shall no razor come upon his hand. Head. Okay. Uh, go a little bit further. And uh, you look at uh, verse number 28. The baby is born. And uh, she goes in verse 28. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. Okay. Now, there's a lot of people who would say Samuel took of the Nazarite vow. Okay. I, I don't know. It does say that he uh, was not going to have a razor to his head. It does say that. It doesn't mention anything else. It doesn't use the word Nazarite. And I, it's not th nothing to argue about necessarily, but people get hung up on that. Well, he was, bless God, he was a Nazarite. And you'll hear that, and then somebody will get just as wound up and say, bless God, no, he wasn't. And uh, no matter what we can say is praise God for Hannah. She had a burden in her heart and her soul. She wanted a child. And she said, you give me that child, I'm going to give him back to you and raise him for your honor and glory. Amen. Okay, so you go over to the book of Luke, chapter number one. John the Baptist. You remember the story about a priest named Zacharias 
married to Elizabeth. They were both righteous before the Lord. They had no child. And it came to pass when, when Zacharias was in the priest's office before the Lord, the order of his course, there appeared an angel Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And then it gets to where Zacharias saw him and he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Look, verse number 13, look at this. Fear, but the angel said unto him, fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Okay. Uh, so he's not going to have uh, strong drink. Okay. So some people would say we, the obvious people who had a lifelong vow of the Nazarite would be Samson, Samuel, and they would say John the Baptist. I would say out of those three, without a shadow of a doubt, Samson. And I would say questionable Samuel, and I'd say that's a questionable thing. I can see it, so I'm not going to go to blows with you on that. Uh, but certainly, uh, John the Baptist was a forerunner of Christ. It does say that many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. But that's why they would say that, because I had a portion of the Nazarite vow, but it wasn't the full Nazarite vow. Amen. We'll know in heaven. Go over, if you will. Let's look at this, Brother J. Hudson, to Acts chapter number 18. What about the Apostle Paul? What about the Apostle Paul? Acts chapter number 18. Paul is headed to Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, he's taken a little bit of a journey there. In verse number 18, chapter 18, verse number 18, it says, And Paul... After this tarried there yet a great good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Chincrea, for he had a vow. Okay. So, interesting, there's one time he had a vow, it looks like at the end of the vow he shaved his head, could have been a Nazarite vow, doesn't specifically say it, if you want to come to blows over that. You go ahead with, not me, you, you do it with Brother Jay Hudson, okay? Not me, not me. But I wouldn't do that with Jay Hudson, amen. But, but look, that, uh, it looks, it could have been a Nazarite vow, amen. We don't know. His vow ended. We'd look at that. Okay, what about the Lord Jesus Christ? Go to, go to Matthew chapter two. And this is funny because in many people's lists, they'll, they will list for certainly Samson had the Nazarite vow. And then they'll say, uh, Samuel had the Nazarite vow, and they'll say, uh, John the Baptist did, and then uh, some would say Paul, and then there would be some, and many, many would say the Lord Jesus Christ. This is interesting. And you know this is the story of his return to Nazareth. Verse 19, but when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. Now skip ahead just for time's sake to verse 23. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. Now that's Nazareth, Nazareth, Nazarite. I mean, they got a lot of the same letters. Nazareth, Nazarite, Nazareth was a vow or was that a city? It was a city, okay. And he came and dwelt in, in a city called Nazareth that it might be spoken or it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a... Nazarene. And we think about that. And later on in Matthew 21, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Matthew 26, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, of Na Jesus was considered a man from Nazareth. <laughs> it doesn't say anything about the Lord Jesus Christ uh, taking a Nazarite vow. And so Here's the end of the sermon. We, we learned a lot about that. If you want to learn about a Nazarite vow, Numbers chapter number six, without a shadow of doubt, solidified in the Bible, the one that we know took the Nazarite vow without any doubt was Samson. Ah, I don't know about, I don't know about Samuel. I don't know about John the Baptist. I don't know about Paul. We know for certain, without a shadow of doubt, Samson made that Nazarite vow. But a Nazarite vow was a vow of separation. I remember a Bible college kid, by the way, I want to say thank God for, for people who separate themselves for the Lord. I want to say praise God for you. You're going, to, you're going to go through a time in your life when you're going through some troubled waters. And there's troubled waters. You, you, you need to make a decision. 
during those troubled waters, those times of decision, I need to get close to the Lord. And praise God, when you get close to the Lord, you're going to consecrate yourself. You're going to get alone with God. And you're going to, and by the way, I want to say amen to the men and men, women who separate themselves. We all, we all ought to have times when we're, there, there's certainly super uh, dedicated to the Lord. Amen. I remember a Bible college uh, young man, he had made a commitment. He made a commitment. Uh, he's in Bible college to live for God. And he, he said, I want to please God with my life. I want to please God with my life. And there came a time, even at Bible college, he was out with a group of people. All of a sudden, alcohol appears. And immediately, the answer was no. There's not even a, a question. Absolutely not. I don't care if you do it. I don't care if the president of the Bible college uh, uh, cl does that. It doesn't matter. My life is consecrated and dedicated to the Lord. And the same man, there was a, the, the college dorms over there, and across the street, not, not too far down, he had to walk by, there was these apartments, and there was a lady who was not a Christian that lived there that would see him coming, see him coming, and would flirt something fierce with him. And it would even, as he passed by, would invite him, hey, why don't you come in, let's talk for a little bit. And she was not a virtuous woman. But, but the answer for him, it wasn't even a second look. It was an absolutely no. Why? Because he was consecrated to the Lord. And you know, when you're consecrated, you make some decisions. You have those times of separation where you make decisions. Boy, I think, I think the Lord is well pleased. By the way, we could look at verses, and I won't, I won't go into this very much, but be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Then later on it says, wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Boy, you know, we need to be serious about the Lord. We need to be, have times when we're serious. And this could be for a couple of things tonight. Maybe you're going through a period where you got some major decisions to make. Boy, I tell you what, take some time. Maybe not make the Nazarite vow, but why don't you take some time and get away with the Lord? Maybe skip some meals. Maybe do some extra Bible readings, have some extra prayer times, listen to some extra preaching right there, and some extra time calling on the name of the Lord. Lord, I need you. I need you. And boy, I believe the Lord will hear that and be honored with you separating yourself to him. Then we as a church, if I could beg and plead with our church, as we go through these dark times of the world, when we have these young people or a young family or a senior in our church that's serious about the things of God, let's not laugh at them. Let's not hinder them or be a speed bump to them. Let's encourage them, tell them we're thankful for you, and help them as they separate themselves to the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. What an interesting truth. And I was fascinated. I think we could go further into that. But Lord, I think it's relatively simple. A man or a woman uh, would take a time and period in their life, whether it was a short period of 30 days or 100 days, that they'd have a separation to you, Lord. And I pray that we, we have a church filled with people that would be willing to do that, and especially at some serious times in their life, Lord. And I pray that we as a church, we help people, uh, boy, be serious about the things of you, Lord. Lord, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the instruction book that it is. We sure do love you. We sure do need you. In Jesus' name, amen.